Let me join the rest of the world in congratulating SpaceX and NASA on America's return to space flight. Finally, after nine years, American spacecraft are taking American astronauts into orbit. And it all went so flawlessly from the launch to the docking, everything was positively beautiful. What a triumph. And it reminds me of everything that SpaceX had to go through in order to make this happen. I mean, from the successful first unmanned crew test to the unfortunate explosion to all the investigation that followed that to all of the parachute tests. I mean, NASA really put this ship through the ringer. I mean, look at it after its first unmanned test, all burned and scarred and pitted and the parachutes that NASA was ever satisfied with. and. And wait a minute, what's that flag in the foreground? You telling me that this is a Chinese ship and it flew almost a month ago? I mean, it looks a hell of a lot like the, the Crew Dragon. Now wait a minute, wait a minute here. Now here's the Crew Dragon, okay, and then it's, then there's this, and it looks well, I mean, a little different, but it's pretty damn similar. And, and it's heading for the moon eventually? Well, it's true. This as yet unnamed capsule flew to a height of 8,000 kilometers, far higher than the ISS, atop a Long March 5B rocket back in early May. So what does this mean for China's moon ambitions? And what could it mean for the future if Artemis is canceled as so many other moon projects have been in the past? Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. As you can see, I'm up close and personal with you folks right now in an effort to try to get a slightly better audio. Let's see if it works. 27th time's the charm, right? But in any event, tonight we're going to be dealing with something a little unconventional. What if Artemis fails? And what if Elon Musk decides that the moon isn't something that he wants to focus on and decides to head to Mars instead, which is, after all, his primary objective. What happens if NASA decides to abandon the moon as they have done so many times in the past? Well, the one difference that exists this time is the fact that there's somebody else very interested in the moon. And unlike other space agencies across the planet, this one has a space agency that's directly tied to their military. And I am, of course, talking about the People's Republic of China. Now, I must emphasize, all of this is completely hypothetical. The Chinese may very well be looking at the moon for purely scientific and peaceful purposes, but... I have to emphasize that currently China has a military disadvantage against their chief rivals, the United States. And I want to explain tonight how the moon could change all of that if we decide to abandon it. So we're going to get started on that right now. In the late 2030s, the People's Republic of China finally gets sick of having an enemy right off their coast and prepare for a full-scale invasion of Taiwan, pressing even civilian vessels into service for the invasion. 
Bound by their treaty obligations, the United States sends several carrier groups into the area, confident in their ability to triumph since they have spent so much money on their vaunted military and gave up on that expensive and worthless effort to establish a base on the moon. But on the other side of the planet, a meteor-like object streaks through the skies over the city of Colorado Springs. No missile launch is detected in China, and there are no heat traces from the object whatsoever. It does not appear to be a missile of any kind. And yet, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, which has relocated back into Cheyenne Mountain because of the tensions with China, suffers a direct hit. In spite of its uniquely fortified position, the base is completely destroyed by an unparalleled explosion that includes a mushroom cloud, but penetrates deep within the mountain, destroying part of the city, but not as much as a nuclear explosion would, and there's no radiation. As the President and the Joint Chiefs evacuate, wondering what has just happened, the Chinese announce that they have a new weapon system that cannot be retaliated against, that cannot be stopped, that cannot even be detected. And if the United States does not stand down immediately, or if they use their nuclear resources, China will systematically destroy their entire country. Having once believed that his superior nuclear arsenal and missile defense system gave him a clear strategic advantage over the Chinese, and now realizing that he does not have that advantage, the American president decides to leave Taiwan to its fate, and only later on does his advisors at NASA tell him what has actually happened. Now I deal with extreme topics on this channel sometimes, and this is just an extreme version of a weapon system called Rods of God that's been around for a long time, that fire telephone pole-sized pieces of tungsten from orbit. The problem with these kinds of weapons is that the satellites that launch them are, can be clearly identified and violate a number of treaties, but there might be a way around that. And that would be something called a lunar mass driver. Now this is a device that can be used for peaceful purposes. It uses electromagnetic force in the natural vacuum of the moon to launch payloads into lunar orbit to be picked up by spacecraft for lunar mining. But if you put a little bit more juice behind the projectile, it can get a lot more deadly. So if you put your mass driver on the far side of the moon, namely the Aitken Basin where China landed their rover not too long ago, you could fire your mass driver, slingshot it around the moon utilizing its gravity, achieve escape velocity, and then use the Earth's gravity to pull your projectile into collision and it could be quite devastating, achieving close to the equivalent of a nuclear blast depending on the size of your projectile. Now, of course, it would take hours for your projectile to reach its target, but since you launched it from the far side of the moon, no one would have the slightest idea that you'd fired it, and there would be no warning whatsoever that anything was coming because there would be no engines involved or any other types of heat signatures until it hit the atmosphere, and at that point, it would be far too late. And your strategic advantage would be tremendous. Your projectiles would only have to escape one-sixth Earth's gravity to get to their target, whereas anything coming back at you from Earth would have to get away from Earth's massive gravity well. And you would have plenty of notice because it would probably require a very sizable rocket to get a warhead to the location of your military base. And the best part? A mass driver is not technically a weapon, so you wouldn't have violated any treaties until you actually used it. And this weapon would have options, too. Instead of launching a single artificial meteoroid, you could instead launch a payload of individual 
tungsten rods, which could act as a giant shotgun, dealing devastation over a much larger area just before it hit the atmosphere. But could such a weapon, such a mass driver, really be created by a fledgling space agency like China's? I mean, the power requirements alone would be tremendous. It would need huge power capacitors that would need to be recharged over a long period of time, or a dedicated fission reactor at least. How do you get all that up there? Well, ever since China became only the third country to put a man into space, they've been seriously increasing their heavy lift capability and now have a substantial family of Long March rockets, which will soon include the Long March 9, scheduled now for launch in 2028 instead of 2030, which was the original launch date. Now, China hasn't missed the boat on reusability. That capsule that I showed you at the beginning is designed to be reusable, but the Long March 9 is not a reusable rocket. However, it can deliver between 50 and 60 metric tons worth of cargo or human beings as well to the lunar surface, more than enough for the beginnings of a lunar base. And you may not even need the Long March 9 in order to get your ammunition to your mass driver. The moon rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts suggest that the moon has just as much tungsten at least as the Earth does, plus a strange magnetic presence at the lunar south pole on the far side, where the Chinese are doing their studies by the way, indicates the possible presence of large amounts of metal deposits, including perhaps tungsten. Now this of course would still be a huge undertaking, but the country that built the world's fastest maglev train using exactly the same kind of technology that you would need in order to build a mass driver, and also this skyscraper in just 19 days might be quite capable of completing something that I've just described. The Chinese are not to be underestimated. Now, of course, this could be just wild speculation on my part, and the Chinese have accomplished a tremendous amount so far and given us a lot of scientific knowledge that will certainly help the Artemis Project in our efforts to set up a permanent presence on the moon. But even what they've done so far has caused some concern amongst American defense analysts. Jeff Gossel, for example, the top Intel engineer within the Space and Missile Analysis Group, said the following about the satellite that China put around Lagrange Point 2. Quote, you could fly some sort of a weapon around the moon and it comes back. It could literally come at objects in GEO. Now, of course, he was talking about taking out our satellites and blinding us, but nevertheless, he understands, along with other analysts, that the moon represents a clear strategic military advantage. But probably the best quote I found was from Peter Gerritsen, who's an independent military consultant and part of a think tank for space strategy, and he said, quote, CIS Lunar Space offers a vast maneuver space that is difficult to surveil and from which surprises can emerge. The People's Republic of China military-run space program is positioning itself in CIS Lunar Space. We are behind and we must catch up. CIS Lunar Space is already the high ground and the U.S. is already far behind China in its position and its planning. This may be a grave warning, but once again, I must caution you. It's only hypothetical. We cannot say for certain what China's ambitions are on the moon, nor should we leap to conclusions. So once again, I want to go ahead and emphasize, I gave it away there, there's my little microphone. Let's see if it works out. But I want to emphasize to all of you, that this was a purely hypothetical scenario, as I said before. We have no idea what China's intentions are on the dark side of the moon, as we like to call it. 
it may very well be perfectly peaceful and scientific. But as I mentioned before, China has a significant strategic and tactical disadvantage against the United States and will continue to have that disadvantage for the foreseeable future. And if the United States and the rest of the world chooses to abandon the moon, as has been done so many times in the past, this presents an almost irresistible opportunity to the Chinese military. One, frankly, that I would have a hard time passing up if I were them. So, I hope this has shown to all of you that amongst the many other reasons that we should not give up on the moon and Artemis for all of its faults, there's another very potent reason that we may come to regret for a long time. So, until we're on the moon and safely have a self-sustaining presence there, a peaceful presence, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>